We continue now with discussing interpolation, uh, specifically how to think about interpolation in the context of reduced order modeling. Uh, I want to point you to databookudev.com where you can find all the notes, details, and code that we're going to uh, construct during the course of this chapter. And this is chapter 12 of the book on reduced order models. And again, the, the idea of reduced order modeling is to take a high dimensional PDEOD system, find a low dimensional subspace so that you can build a surrogate model in that subspace, which is much cheaper to run and gives you some kind of accurate representation of the full high dimensional system. So here's the construct again, and just to highlight it for you, uh, you have the high dimensional system that you want to approximate by some low dimensional system. You project using your SVD modes or POD modes onto some subspace V of R, and here's the evolution equations for what the SVD modes are doing in time. Everything here can be easily computed except for the term with the nonlinearity, as expected. Uh, nonlinearity makes lots of interesting things happen and of course makes a challenge for you here. The linear term can be pre-computed to be an R by R matrix, so you do that one time upfront cost. That's easy to do. You can now simulate this, except for here, there was this idea of the projection to the subspace is easy, but now the nonlinearity makes you have to produce inner products at every time step of the nonlinear term, which if you don't interpolate that, you'll have to do inner products of n-dimensional state spaces, which then that means you haven't really reduced the model at all because you're still working n-dimensional system. But if you can find a way to accurately approximate this uh, using interpolation, then we can actually move forward and have a truly R by R dimensional system that we're actually solving very rapidly. So the question is how do we do this? Well, we've been talking about interpolation quite a bit. We've talked about this idea of gappy POD, and we've constructed a couple of principled sampling architectures. And now uh, the idea is that, you know, if I want to do this in a perturbation, it's all about taking my n-dimensional state space U and dropping it to an r-dimensional space U tilde. So the P matrix tells me about that measurement. And the, go the goal really is how do I construct that P? How do I construct that measurement matrix that's going to drop me from the n-dimensional space to the r-dimensional space where the measurements are an accurate represent, give me great interpolation points so that whatever I do in this r-dimensional space, I can go back and reconstruct the n-dimensional space. So here's what we're doing, sparse measurements and reconstruction with that P matrix. This is the construct that we want to use and figure out how to measure it, compute those A tildes. And what I want to talk about today is another principled architecture, and this one is sort of more the state of the art of what people do in practice nowadays. So there's a nice evolution of historical ideas from the Gappy POD of Sirovich and Everson to Karen Wilcox, who presented one of the first or the first uh, principled architecture for selecting the interpolation points to you have work out of Karniadakis' group that also presented some methodologies for doing this. Two, this paper in 2004. Um, by the way, all these principled location, principled selection methods, locations, w it has an algorithm, and the question is, do you want to pay the price of that? That will cost you to get those selection locations. And this is sort of one of the top ways to do it. It's really came out of the work with Madea and Patter, Patter in 2004 on the inter empirical interpolation method, IMS. And this is very commonly used. It was uh, also developed here afterwards by Chaturantuba and Sorensen in 2010. And so really this took a lot of, took the ideas out of this paper, brought it here, started bringing it into uh, uh, some broader context and applications. And this is a very nice paper to read as well. Uh, and then more recently, Dermach and Guirkin, who in 2016 introduced uh, a version of this with using the QR algorithm to do the selection of the sensor locations. So I like to highlight these three papers as sort of just, you know, in terms of timelines, 2004, 2010, 2016. <coughs> and so these are important ones that are out there being used today. And the nice thing about the QDIME is algorithmically, it's in some sense kind of trivial to implement. 
not that these are that hard, but this is just use a QR pivot column selection in you know MATLAB or Python, and it's it's sort of trivial. So I, I like this one quite a bit uh, from a practical point of view. So how does this thing work? Well, the idea behind these IME, DIME, QDIME techniques is to, uh, the nonlinearity is the problem. So what we want to do is actually, what they propose doing is to say, well, take the nonlinear terms. So when I compute that nonlinearity, I'm going to stack the computation of the construction, the evaluation of that nonlinear term into different rows of a matrix where each row is at time t t1, t2, t all the way to t of m. So just like I did to get my SVD modes originally or my POD modes, modes originally, I stacked the state space into some matrix and I did the SVD. I'm going to now just take and isolate the nonlinearity and SVD it itself. So now this means I'm committed to a second SVD. And so I'm going to take the SVD of this to produce this decomposition. So I already have the SVD to generate POD modes, and now I'm doing a second SVD on the nonlinear term itself. But remember, the nonlinear term is the one that's difficult to evaluate. So the hope is by isolating it, finding its low dimensional representation, and doing the selection of interpolation points in that subspace will give me an advantage, and it give me an advantage in how to project the dynamics into that subspace too. All right, so here is the algorithm, and I'm focused on the dime algorithm actually from Sorensen uh, and Chantarantabat. Uh, so here we go, the dime algorithm. So the first thing you do is you collect your data, obviously your data matrices X into some snapshots you want through N. You're going to SVD that, and that's going to be your low dimensional subspace. But also you collect the nonlinear terms, in other words, the nonlinear terms of U, T1, nonlinear term ut2 and so forth. You SVD the nonlinear terms. And what we're going to look at here is do a p, a rank p approximation of the nonlinear term. So C here, capital C, that matrix is like the POD modes, but now these are the POD modes for the nonlinear term. And I'm going to take a p rank approximation, and those vectors are C1 through C of P. The way this algorithm works, it first takes the dominant first mode, which is C1, and it finds the maximum and says, that's the first interpolation point. Is that the maximum of the first mode? So that sets up my initial measurement matrix, P1. Remember, the P matrix is what we're trying to determine, is which, where do I sample to guess the bet to get the best interpolation. So principally speaking, it says, do the, not, do the SVD of the nonlinearity, take the dominant first mode, find the maximum. That's your first sensor location, interpolation point that we're going to use for the nonlinear terms. Now, the way that you select the, the, next, the next P locations, because we're going to do a P rank approximation here, is you're going to basically take now the data, project this space into this measurement location, P1, that you start off with P1, and it's going to be P1 and P2 and so forth, these measurement locations. You're going to, whatever sensors you have, you take and you project now the subspace C of J. In other words, up to those number of modes. So if I have two sensors, I would take the first two columns of the C matrix, in other words, the, fir the first two dominant modes, and on the right side, you put the third mode. See it? The, so the first two modes, and you look at the third mode, and you say, what is the projection in this? Remember, this is now a, uh, this is the, the support space of the measurements. So you're saying, in the support space of these two measurements, how much of this projects into the third mode? So if I have two modes, how much projects into the third mode? And that's given by constant C. And what I want to do is say, well, with that projection, I can compute a residual, which is given right by here. So take the residual, which is this mode minus C of J with that C of J, the C of J being determined from here of that projection. And what I do, this is called the residual. And in that residual, I go look to see where the residual is biggest. So that's kind of in some sense where the most error is. So in my in my constrained subspace of support, wherever there's a big error in the next direction, I say, okay, put, an error, put a measurement there. Put an interpolation point there to take the error down. And that's exactly what it does. 
and then you repeat. I've made a graphical construct of this with the idea of hopefully to help illustrate this. So what I do here, here are my modes. Let's just say I have a subspace C of P, C1, C3, C of 10. So there's 10 modes here that say, I'm gonna do our rank 10 approximation. So what I first do is say, well, okay, the first thing you do in iteration one, I look at the first column, C of one right here, right here, and I say, okay, C of one, which is the first column, uh, I just look at the maximum, there it is. I take that maximum, and I now make that my measurement location. And now what I do is say, okay, let's compute this residual. In other words, I wanna see in this measurement subspace, how much of this projects onto the C2 direction. And wherever that's maximal, I'm gonna look at that residual and say the maximum is here, I should put a sensor location there. So now at iteration number two, I have these two measurement locations. So I have the columns of this. I sort of say, okay, I have a measurement here and here. And the second measurement now is given by here. And now what I do is say, okay, let's now compute the residual again. And I want to know is if I'm using this subspace of measurements, how does it project onto C3? Now, of course, if I had full state measurements, there would be no projection on C3 because they're all orthogonal to each other. But of course, I'm working in a subspace, just like I showed you in the Gappy POD method in the first lecture on Gappy, these modes in the support space are no longer orthogonal. And so you're asking the question, well, how not orthogonal are there? Where's the, where's the largest uh, uh, residual? The largest residual is here. So you pick that location and so forth. So the whole game here is to look at these, uh, an increasing set of measurement subspace that you have, right, the support space, and trying to say in the next direction that I would pick, which is given by these modes, where's the largest residual? Let's squish the residual down. So that is the architecture, I'm, dime. Uh, and the QR, actually it's a little bit different using QR column pivoting to do this process. So it's a little easier. But the idea here is then, here's the approximation of the nonlinear function. You're just, it's a projection of the measurements onto the subspace of the modes of the SVD modes of the nonlinear terms. And so that's how you would approximate this nonlinearity. So this is your projection right here. So before, remember, we were always projecting into the SVD modes of the whole system. Now you're projecting onto the SVD modes of the nonlinearity itself. Okay. <coughs> So that's how you would do this, and you construct that measurement matrix to optimally, or this is a greedy search algorithm, so this is a greedy method to construct that P of T. That's the big deal of what you're doing with all of these architectures is constructing P of Ts. Okay, so uh, I'll just finish by saying this. This is a little bit more complicated algorithm, but it's not that hard, actually. It just, it's really taking advantage of the subspace that's particular to the nonlinearity and finding a way to uh, recursively pick a location and now in that support space, seeing in the next direction of these principled, these POD modes of the nonlinearity, finding ways in that projected space, how do I squish the residual error down as far as possible pick the sensor locations where residuals are maximal and continue on the process. And this is sort of, in some sense, the current state of the art. A lot of people use IM, DIME, QDIME as sort of the go-to method in a lot of reduced order modeling architectures. And so this is something important to uh, consider. Uh, by the way, the code for that is up online, and you can find it here, databookuw.com, a PDF as well. And in the next lecture, I'm gonna actually implement the DIME algorithm uh, as well as QDIME to show you how it can work in a reduced order model settling, setting.